you may get a vaccine. You may receive the vaccine and you may develop immunity to the infection. And you may seem fine. You may not have an adverse reaction. But when you're re-exposed to that same virus a year later, two years later, your immune system overreacts and it produces a very severe form of the disease which can be fatal. And this was seen with the attempts to produce a SARS vaccine. This is seen with the experimental respiratory syncytial virus vaccine that was given to children. And it's called immune priming or pathogenic priming, that the immune system is set up by the vaccine to produce an exaggerated and dangerous immune response down the line. And we must be very, very careful of that because that is highly likely with any coronavirus vaccine. And if that happens, then if you're running safety studies for two or three weeks, you will never see it. You will not see it until people are re-exposed to that infection a year later or so. From the Weston A. Price Foundation, welcome to the Wise Traditions podcast for wise traditions in food, farming, and the healing arts. We are your source for scientific knowledge and traditional wisdom to help you achieve optimal health. Hey, Hilda here. This is episode 239, and our focus today is on whether or not a vaccine against the coronavirus is a good idea. We need to learn more about the history of vaccines developed against viruses, what's at stake exactly, and what we might expect if we choose to get it or if we choose not to. Today, our guest is Dr. Andrew Wakefield, and he is going to answer these questions. He is the doctor whose discoveries have opened up an entirely new perspective on childhood autism, the gut-brain link, and vaccine safety. He has been studying the latter for some time. We turn to him because he is a man who is willing to speak the truth, no matter the consequences. Basically, he's something of a whistleblower in the medical industry. He is also an award-winning filmmaker who produced Vaxxed and who has another film on the horizon. A couple of fun notes before we begin the conversation. At the end of each episode starting today, we are going to read your letters. Every Wise Traditions Journal has letters to the editor with heartwarming stories and or challenging perspectives, so we are going to pick one letter a week to highlight on the show. So stick around to the very end of the episode where you will hear some positivity to encourage you on your own health journey. And here's some more good news. We are hosting a giveaway. You guys, we just reached the 3 million download mark with this podcast, and we are so thankful for your listening and sharing it. We are celebrating by a giveaway with an amazing prize package, an alpaca wise traditions vest worth over like $125, a signed copy of Nourishing Traditions, and a cooking DVD featuring Sally Fallon the president of the Weston A. Price Foundation. This whole package is valued at over $200, and to enter, it's super simple. Just become a member for $40 this week or make a donation of any size again this week. The deadline is May 1st to be eligible to win. The links are in the show notes to make it easy for you to participate. And that's it. Thank you so much. By joining in this giveaway, you are supporting the Foundation's important work of education, research, and activism. And you keep our podcast going too. Also, a quick thank you to Ancestral Supplements. They suggest that we support our immune system with wholesome, nose-to-tail, nutrient-dense foods. Ancestral Supplements, lung, thymus, and colostrum will provide our bodies with the vitamins and minerals we need to stay healthy and fight viruses. A healthy thymus builds a robust immune system. Beef lung supports the respiratory system and lung cells. And colostrum supports optimal gut and immune system function. I love these real food supplements and take some every day. Visit ancestralsupplements.com to try them out. Ancestral supplements, lung, thymus, and colostrum. They are putting back in what the modern world has left out. This is Holistic Hilda, and you're listening to Wise Traditions. Welcome to Wise Traditions, Andy. Uh, It's great to be here. Thank you so much. I'm very curious to explore with you our relationship to microbes and how that has anything to do with our current situation. Can you give us a little history? Yes, and it's a fascinating story and one that I've studied now for 
over 30 years of my professional career. It's really a question of perspective. And when, when you go back to the time of Louis Pasteur and then Fleming and people like this, you see in what they wrote that microbes, microorganisms, even though they were poorly characterized at the time, were perceived as enemies. To Pasteur, he wrote about the enemies, these enemies, and the hope that science would conquer the enemy. And that was the perception at the time. And you can understand it in an historical context when diseases like syphilis were rife, neurosyphilis was a major problem, battlefield gangrene was a major problem, rheumatic fever was a huge problem. And antibiotics, when they came along and dealt with those infections very effectively, led to the perception, reinforced the perception that they were indeed enemies. And how are things different now? Now we know better. Now we live in an era of the microbiome. Now we understand that while some of these microorganisms may be harmful, many, many, many of them are essential to our survival. In fact, what's emerging is that the health, the consistency, the makeup, and the well-being of the gut microbiome in particular is essential to everything that we do in terms of our metabolism, in terms of our uh, development, in terms of our immune health. And more recently, we've gone on to discover this gut-brain interaction to the extent that we now know that the microbiome influences our brain development and our mood and our personality. It's fascinating that this, so no man is an island. Mm. We could not exist on the, uh, this earth without the health of our microbiome, which in terms of numbers of organisms exceeds our own number of cells. So we've now learned something very different. And what we need to do is treat that microbiome with a great deal of respect. And this applies not only to organisms that we perceive now as being helpful, friendly, but those that historically pathogens, we need to accord them a great deal of respect, because if we do not, we will get into a very, very difficult situation. And what happened as a consequence of our belief in the miracle, and these are the words that were used by public health physicians at the time, is that antibiotics were a miracle. And of course, historically, they that was a justifiable perception. But nature does not stand still. Nature evolves at an extraordinarily high rate with great efficiency because it is geared up to do just that, to survive, to prevail. And so we create it through our injudicious use of antibiotics, a plethora of microbes that are now highly dangerous, that are antibiotic resistant and are causing what public health officials now describe as the end of modern medicine, the post-antibiotic apocalypse. These are their words. Yes, what you're saying makes sense. I understand that we have been overusing antibiotics, and even the medical community is recognizing that. Um, But I want to ask you, a moment ago you said that we need to give even bad pathogens the respect they deserve. What do you mean by that? What does that look like? Well, I'll I'll give you an example. And we've now entered into the same arena with vaccines, for example, against viruses that we had with um, antibiotics. Indeed, vaccines across the board. We're now seeing the emergence of uh, bacterial pertussis strains that are resistant to the pertussis vaccine immunity uh, or measles strains that are resistant to the immunity induced by the vaccine strain. We never saw this before. But in the face of Uh, of intensive vaccination, we have pushed these organisms to mutate. That is what we do. We create a genetic selection pressure, they mutate and they develop a resistance to the immunity induced by the vaccine. So we're seeing strains of measles emerging in the world that are resistant to the immunity created by the vaccine, whatever that is, and it is caused by vaccination. So we're creating a potential nightmare because we are creating strains of these viruses to which man has no immunity. And we are going to behave potentially as what is described as a virgin soil population. It's like we've never seen this infection before. That would be the worst case scenario. 
and then we're back to where we started potentially. Are you referring to what I've heard called superbugs? Absolutely. This is a sort of term in common parlance for for bugs which are resistant to whatever medical interventions we might throw at them, or indeed preventions like vaccines that we might try and throw at them. And they have been created as a direct consequence of the injudicious use of these things and the failure of scientists, public health officials to recognize that we create that genetic selection pressure by the way in which we use these interventions. So in other words, what we thought could save us and which at first seemed like something of a miracle cure is now actually harming us and is causing a ripple effect of consequences that we might not have predicted. That is that is exactly right. If you offend nature, if you make small changes to biological systems, ecosystems, nature will exact a huge price and it won't always do it immediately. It will be delayed and you will see the consequences reaped in generations to come, potentially, but it will happen. So what next is the question? What is the medical community looking to do and what is your perspective on it? What is it different? Uh, What do you think we should do next? Well, the response of the medical community is the one that the medical community really responds with when it has no answers. It's increasingly recognized that it's caused this situation. Certainly in the upper echelons of, of public health and the pharmaceutical companies, they've recognized that they have created this problem, even though they, they don't wish to discuss it. And so, as ever with medicine, the recommendation is take more, double the dose. And so we're now seeing booster doses of, of MMR and booster, booster doses and booster boost, and it doesn't work. It doesn't work. And the, any immunity that's induced by those booster doses is short-lived and really just exacerbates the problem. But there is no answer. I'm sure that within the R&D facilities of pharmaceutical companies involved in vaccine development, there is a great deal of interest in developing novel forms of viral vaccines, but they are terrifying. The proposed COVID vaccine, an RNA-based vaccine that's never been used in humans before, is a terrifying concept to many of us, but here it is being put into humans without any proper safety testing at all. So it it brings in that, that, that whole issue that is of clearly of of contemporaneous relevance. And it's very alarming. The people who have created this problem have no answers to it. This gives me pause. And I think it probably is giving everyone pause. But the problem is, Andy, we are actually alarmed and terrified by the virus. And we are looking for a vaccine to help us out. Some of us even see the vaccine as our only hope. I take it you would disagree with that. I would disagree totally. I, firstly, there is the intrinsic issue of the vaccine per se. You're using a vaccine strategy that's never been used before. People have tried for many, many, many years to develop a vaccine to the common cold virus, the coronavirus, and failed and failed and failed. Therefore, it seems to be um, an exquisitely difficult problem to deal with. And our experience of these untried, untested vaccines that are rushed into the market is not a good one. Not a good one at all. And we saw this as is illustrated in a new film that I'm just finishing is the problem with the swine flu vaccine in the the late 1970s, where not only was the virus that was circulating not what the CDC said it was, it was not like the killer swine flu of 1917. The vaccine was uh, dangerous. It was rushed to market, just as we're seeing now. And what we, we 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 witnessed was paralysis and death as a consequence of the vaccine. The cure was infinitely worse than whatever it was intended to treat. So history is repeating itself. And the hope is that no one will remember that or be reminded of that history as they rush towards market in these circumstances. I do not think a vaccine is the answer. I'm much more inclined to believe that natural herd immunity is an answer, that those who are resistant to this infection, be they young people, healthy people, should be exposed to the infection, should get it, should develop natural herd immunity. And those who are susceptible, the elderly, 
and those with comorbid conditions should be protected and isolated for a period of time such that that natural herd immunity can develop. And what we're seeing in Sweden, as an example, is just this strategy, no lockdown and an attempt to, uh, I imagine, just let this play itself out as most respiratory pathogens do. And what we see when now the numbers are emerging is that this disease is no worse in terms of its mortality than the quoted figures for seasonal, seasonal influenza in this country. So why are we in this extraordinary situation? It's such a great question. And yet, I remember when Fauci said recently on a newscast that he didn't want the population to develop herd immunity. And I'm told that he said that because he doesn't want to see the fallout of all of the deaths. Like, you know, we've heard that in Ecuador, there are so many people dying that they have run out of coffins, that they need to use cardboard boxes or something. And I guess, you know, he doesn't want people to get out because no matter how strong and virile they may seem, they may end up dying and nobody wants a lot of deaths on their watch. Yes, I, I, I disagree with Tony Fauci on many, many levels. The data that are emerging from other countries Data are infinitely difficult to interpret when you have a situation as we have in this country where deaths in people who are coronavirus positive or have a coronavirus like disease doctors are being told to label those as coronavirus deaths when many of them may not be. We're in a situation where influenza mortality is grossly inflated by the government because they've labeled any flu like illness an influenza death. They've created a nightmare in terms of data. What are we to actually believe? We do not know because definitions have been changed, adapted to suit government policy. If you want to persuade a population to get a vaccine, a flu vaccine, for example, you will inflate the number of flu deaths by causing any respiratory illness leading to death, a flu, an influenza death. And that is the circumstances in which we currently find ourselves and where we are headed with coronavirus as well. So the data are implausible and really difficult to interpret, particularly when you're comparing one country with another. I hear you. And there is a lot of confusion about the numbers. How many deaths are really COVID related? Are doctors being coerced to label deaths as COVID related, even if it was unrelated. I mean, it's hard to know what's going on exactly. But I hear you saying something between the lines, and I want to ask you about it. Are you implying that the numbers are being inflated purposely to frighten us and to move us toward mandatory vaccination? There is a clear agenda to not only create a vaccine. And Bill Gates has said it himself many, many times. The, we will only return to normality worldwide when all 7 billion people have been vaccinated. That is his dream. That is his intention. What's extraordinary to me and must be extraordinary to many of your listeners is that one man, by virtue of his wealth and virtually by virtue of his wealth alone, is in a position to dictate global health policy and personal health choice. That, to me, is absolutely extraordinary. A man with zero qualifications in this field. That, that is an extraordinary situation, and people really need to wake up to what is going on. There is an effort to push the vaccine agenda, and this won't just be coronavirus vaccine. This, whatever the source, whatever the origins of this, and I'm not going to speculate on that, whatever the origins, it is being used to leverage worldwide cradle to grave mandatory vaccination for all recommended vaccines, not just the coronavirus vaccine. And so some people might say, I want the vaccine. I want my children vaccinated. I'm not afraid of this push because I think it's probably our best bet for protecting our health right now. And so that's fine if they want to do that, right? But do you think our own right to make this choice is at risk right now? Our freedom has never been more at risk in the history of the world. You're absolutely right. If those vaccines are available, then it is entirely your choice. Go ahead. And I wish you the very best of luck. 
Having studied vaccines intensively for 30 years, I would not take that choice. But again, choice is essential, particularly in determining health care choices and, and what goes into the bodies of you and your children. But we should be extremely alarmed right now about the, the dramatic attempt, the draconian attempt to take away health freedoms in the interests of the pharmaceutical industry. The pharmaceutical industry, the vaccine manufacturers own the media, they own the politicians, they have immense influence, they are extraordinarily powerful, and they are writing public health policy state by state by state in this country, and they are trying to take away the only person standing, the only people standing between the child, the vulnerable child and, their, and the pharmaceutical industry are the parents now. And they're trying to remove the parents from that equation by removing parental choice, removing uh, exemptions, minimizing medical exemptions, taking away philosophical and religious exemptions, and making it very, very difficult to do anything but bend to their will. And then they own you. They own the population. That is their agenda. Well, these are very piercing words. And I'm just wondering, aren't there people in the pharmaceutical industry who are like, we believe in vaccines. We actually believe this is the best thing for people. And I just can't imagine that there are people in the industry who, or that everyone in the industry is thinking, you know, they just want to control us and manipulate us to do their will. No, I mean, there are people who may believe that, and that's absolutely, their belief is fine. You know, that's, they're entitled to that belief. Do not force your belief on me. Do not tell me what I have got to do. I'm perfectly capable of researching this and establishing to my own level of satisfaction whether I think this is something I want to do or do for my children or not. But do not take away my health choice. We've experienced throughout history when health choice has been taken away, when we have pushed, forced medical procedures onto people, whether it's sterilization or experimentation in prison camps, we have we realize that this is a this does not work. It has never worked. It has a terrible history and it will fail and it will fail and it will fail again. You cannot force people to make medical choices, medical decisions against their will. That's right. Isn't there like an old law or principle that's supposed to guide all of our medical decisions. Do you know what I'm talking about? Well, there is a, what's called the Hippocratic Oath. In fact, I don't think it was Hippocrates who, who coined the term, but it was first do no harm, primum non nocere, first do no harm. And that is a sort of something by which doctors should live and conduct themselves professionally, that the first thing they do is no harm. And uh, vaccines do harm. And... Uh, Therefore, people need to be informed, fully informed. It is all based in the end upon fully informed consent. People need all the information and then they need to be free to make up their own minds, whether they wish to do something like vaccinate or not. Well, we know that you've studied vaccines extensively. And so let's go back for a minute to the discussion about the microbiome. What does the latest research say about the relationship between vaccines and the gut? Well, very interestingly, I mean, I, there, firstly, there has been a, a dearth of science done in this field because when we linked MMR vaccine through the parent stories to gut injury and brain injury and therefore established the sort of gut brain axis of disease and the potential role of the vaccine in that, then people were punished for doing this kind of research. And so what happened to me was used as an example to other doctors, other scientists to say, if you get involved in this, this is what will happen to you. So very interesting research has been done in sort of more recently that shows, for example, that the immune response to vaccines is dependent. It depends to some extent on the health of our microbiome. Um, so gut bacteria are influencing the way in which we respond to vaccines, which in itself is, is an interesting observation. But it's fair to say that in the field of developmental disorders and autism, there is now extensive evidence. The most consistent finding, in fact, in autism research, other than the epidemic, is that there is a gut-brain link. Um, that is, and that is very, very interesting. And, and we would have been far, far further ahead in that research had we had the pressure not been put on people not to do it. 
But um, in terms of vaccines and, and the gut, the gut microbiome, we are still in the early days of our understanding. And what about the microbiome and this virus? Again, I, now I, I, I've been so busy with this new film that I've not been <laughs> focused on this, but I did see a paper the other day, I think it was from Europe, looking at the possibility that what we were seeing here, I think it was from France, is that the virus is working indirectly as a respiratory pathogen, as a respiratory causing agent by infecting or influencing gut bacteria. And it's the immune response that is generated as a consequence of that interaction with gut bacteria that is leading to an autoimmune type reaction in the lung. People are saying, in, in from ERs to researchers, saying that this is not a classic respiratory pathogen. It's not producing a pneumonia or a pneumonitis in the way that we expect infectious agents to do. And as a consequence, using ventilation in the way that we use it for pneumonia is not helping and maybe harming patients. That in fact, it's working indirectly by causing an immune reaction and fibrosis or scarring in the lung in those patients who get it severely rather than a direct effect. And that, that, that is very interesting. And I, once this film is done, I will spend some more time researching that. Speaking about your film, what drove you to put it out and what's it about exactly? Well, I, this is my third film and, and, and film has been an extraordinarily effective way of communicating with a very wide number of people. The first thing you do is you entertain people. The second thing you do is educate them. And if you can get them entertained, if you can get them sitting forward in their seats and you can appeal to people who st historically wouldn't have entertained the subject or looked at it or had a peripheral interest in it, if you can create an entertaining film that informs them, then you can you can get to a lot of people. And, and Vaxxed, my last film, did exactly that. It, it reached millions and millions worldwide and really changed the, the entire debate about the safety of vaccines. And so I was very keen to make the, the latest film. It's a story about what really is at the heart of everything we're going through now, mandatory vaccination, increased numbers of vaccinations in children worldwide, cradle to grave vaccination, pregnancy to grave vaccination, approaches to uh, COVID, and the sheer wealth accumulation and the power of those who benefited from vaccination policy, pharmaceutical industry being first amongst them. And it's a story of the National Childhood Vaccine Injury Act. Mm. That Ronald Reagan signed into law in 1986, which gave initially a measure of liability to protection to the pharmaceutical industry for damage done by their vaccines and latterly complete blanket protection from immunity. They cannot be sued in any court in the land mm -hmm. by the parents of a child damaged by a vaccine. And many people don't know this. Many politicians don't know it. Joe Biden said in the uh, presidential a candidacy debate the other day. Imagine if I got up here and said we give indemnity to the pharmaceutical industry. Well, <laughs> it's a you know a note to you, Joe. We do. That is exactly what we do. It was one of the most dangerous pieces of legislation ever to be passed. Not because it was not well intended, certainly by those parents who supported it. Not because it was not set out in a way that. Had they followed the letter of the law, it would have been fair and, and efficient and generous. But because the industry didn't want it to work, because the agencies didn't want it to work, the CDC, the FDA, it was systematically corrupted from the very beginning. And so this is a story of how the act came into being. Mm. If people think they know what happened, they don't. And it's an extraordinary story of the most terrible fraud and corruption that uh, has been exposed through discovery documents that have never seen the light of day. It's about how once passed, the act was systematically corrupted by the very agencies of the government who were instructed by statute to uh, follow the letter of the law and the dreadful damage done to children as a consequence. And it is, it's, a, it's an astonishing tale. And I thought I knew the origins of it. I really had no idea. Um, and of course, then the consequences, both intended and unintended, 
mm. and the power of the industry to influence every aspect of our lives is first and foremost amongst those. And therefore, what we are experiencing now is playing out. It is our, our third act, if you like. The final part of this film really looks at what is happening contemporaneously in the context of the history of vaccination policy in this country. And bringing it to today makes me think of Bill Gates and how he wants to experiment with developing this coronavirus. And I understand he wants indemnity from other nations. In other words, he wants to be able to, you know, promote it without any liability and not have any, you know, and not have to pay if anyone gets injured or killed from it. That's exactly right. He said that as much. He says, we need this vaccine. Everybody should get it. Nobody should have any choice. Uh, but we'll need indemnity. Thank you very much. He has made it quite clear that he wants 7 billion people vaccinated, that he does not want this to be, you know, nobody should be exempt. And indeed, there uh, is going to need to be liability. Coming up, Andy talks about why even pro-vaccine advocates suggest that we move forward with extreme caution as we look to develop a coronavirus vaccine. He also offers his ideas on what we can do to protect our health freedom and help others understand exactly what's at stake. You're listening to the Wise Traditions Podcast from the Weston A. Price Foundation. We pause now to recognize our sponsors. Chelsea Green Publishing. Chelsea Green is recognized as a leading publisher of books about organic farming and gardening, homesteading, local food, restorative living, and diet-focused integrative health. Some recent and best-selling health titles include Cancer and the New Biology of Water by Dr. Thomas Cowan, It's All in Your Mouth by Dr. Dominic Nischwitz, The Metabolic Approach to Cancer by Nasha Winters and Jess Higgins Kelly, and The Invisible Rainbow by Arthur Furstenberg. So go to chelseagreen.com and enter the code WISE19 at checkout to receive 25% off your next print book purchase. And be sure to sign up for their newsletter too so you can stay up to date on new releases and audiobooks. And Ancestral Supplements. Support your immune system with wholesome nose-to-tail nutrient-dense foods. Ancestral Supplements, lung, thymus, and colostrum will provide your body with the vitamins and minerals it needs to stay healthy and fight off viruses. Why does thymus matter? To a very large extent, the health of the thymus determines the health of the immune system. Ancestral Supplements Beef Lung supports the respiratory system and lung cells. Lung is a source of lung-specific building blocks, peptides, and enzymes, and lung tissue has historically been used by those with respiratory disorders, colds, flu, and more. And Ancestral Supplements Colostrum supports optimal gut and immune system function, thymus health, and human growth and cell repair. I love these real food supplements, and I love that they are not synthetic in any way. So visit ancestralsupplements.com to try them out for yourself. Ancestral Supplements Lung, Thymus, and Colostrum. Ancestral Supplements puts back in what the modern world has left out. This is Holistic Hilda, and you're listening to Wise Traditions. And the big danger, the big worry about this vaccine, and one of the reasons that others, even those who are ardent pro-vaccinologists, have been concerned about is that you may get a vaccine, you may receive the vaccine, and you may develop immunity to the infection, and you may seem fine, you may not have an adverse reaction. But when you're re-exposed to that same virus a year later, two years later, your immune system overreacts and it produces a very severe form of the disease which can be fatal and this was seen with the attempts to produce a SARS vaccine this is seen with the experimental respiratory syncytial virus vaccine that was given to children and it's called immune priming or pathogenic priming that the immune system is set up by the vaccine to produce an exaggerated and dangerous immune response down the line. And we must be very, very careful of that because that is highly likely with any coronavirus vaccine. And if that happens, then if you're running safety studies for two or three weeks, you will never see it. You will not see it until people are re-exposed to that infection a year later or so. And with this was seen recently in the mass dengue fever vaccination in uh, the Far East, 
uh, Indonesia or the Philippines, somewhere like that. And children were given this vaccination. Millions of children were given the vaccine that it appears the pharmaceutical company knew was problematic in this respect. And when they had got the dengue fever vaccine, when they were re-exposed to dengue fever, many of them died and many of them remained susceptible to very, very severe dengue fever, seemingly for the rest of their lives. The vaccine was withdrawn but it should never have been allowed on the market in the first place. So this is not without historical precedent. This is not conspiracy theory. This is a fact. And this is why even people like Paul Offit are saying we must be careful about a coronavirus vaccine, but not Bill Gates. <laughs> He's not saying that. So let me ask you, Andy, this is all really heavy and I want to get really practical for our listeners right now. I know a lot of us have friends and family who are going to be first in line to get that vaccine because they believe everything they've heard on the media and everything they've been told that this vaccine is our only hope, that we can't have mass gatherings until we're all vaccinated, that we can't return to normal. And so do you have any tools or a tactic for presenting this information, for communicating it to our friends and family? Yes, I do. I mean, what? How? Okay. How do you how do you educate people about this? There is no excuse for people not to be educated. When I got involved in this, there was very little information. Now there is an abundance of information. And how do you sort out what is real and what isn't? Well, this is what the film is about. And I am not just pushing the film. The film was written. It was designed to answer your very question. It is the discovery of a couple, a husband and wife. She's pregnant late in life first baby. It is their journey, their voyage of discovery of this issue. It is how they go down the rabbit hole against resistance. What about polio? What about smallpox? Resistance within the family. Mm -hmm. How do they answer this question for themselves? And they do the research. And when they do the research, they come to their own conclusions. And that's not their starting point. And the reason for doing this is because they are us. We can do this as well. There is no excuse not to do it. In fact, it is mandatory that everybody gets educated because these decisions are so far reaching, not just for our family, but for the survival of mankind as a whole. So with that in mind, the approach I've taken is to make a film that does exactly what you're asking right now, the issue that you're addressing. Sit down and watch this and then take the initiative and get more informed, get more informed. And if at the end of that process, you decide that you want to get vaccinated, that's absolutely fine. But take that decision from, not from a position of ignorance, but from a position of knowledge. And then at least, you know, you can reconcile your decision in, in, on the basis of, of due diligence. So that would be my recommendation. That was the purpose. That was the reason the film was made in the way it, it has been made to carry that message that we too can do this. It is within our power. But you know what, Andy? It is difficult to change our paradigm and our worldview, isn't it? In other words, I think it's just so much easier to go with the flow and to believe everything you've heard all your life, you know, phrases like safe and effective and other mantras like that. It is, but you must. Uh, people must appreciate that we are in neo-Darwinian terms, we are at a defining moment in human evolution. What's happening now and, and vaccination policy globally will determine who lives and who dies, who reproduces and who doesn't reproduce, what, what element of the, of the population survive and which don't. That's where we are. That's how big this decision is. And uh, so it's not one to be undertaken lightly. And so if you are frightened... If you are prepared to be a supplicant, if you're prepared to just roll over in the face of what you watch on CNN, which is owned by the pharmaceutical industry, if that's what your position is, then you will make your decisions accordingly. And, and I wish you the very best of luck. And I'm not trying to persuade you as to which decision you should take other than to get informed. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it is such a big issue that if you decide to be scared, if you decide to buy into the narrative, fed to you by Big Brother, then you will live or die accordingly. Absolutely. 
Now let's speak to those who are like, no, that's not me. I know I've done my research. I know what my rights are. I want to defend my medical freedom. What advice would you have for those folks? It's really very straightforward in the short term. In the longer term, it requires a great deal more consideration of the issues at hand. But, and I, I present this not from a political perspective, um, and this is irrespective of your historical political affiliations, but the Democrats have made it quite clear that they are in favor of federal uh, vaccine mandates. That It's now at the state level, and those states that have taken away parental rights have done so have been democratic states, and the Democrats are wholly in favor of of removing medical exemptions. By and large, the Republicans are against it. And um, so, and this is seen right up the way up to, to the White House as well. So we are in a situation where the, the decision we take in terms of how we cast our vote will determine whether we move towards mass mandatory vaccination, which no doubt would include a coronavirus vaccine, or whether we encourage and cherish individual choice. And I'm not, again, I'm not going to persuade people how to, or try and persuade people how they should vote. But those, that, that is the choice. Mm-hmm. This is that, the dichotomy. There is no middle ground. That is where we are. It's a stated case of the Democrats, Healthy People 2020, that there will be a move towards the global policy of uh, the World Health Organization's strategy of, of mandatory vaccination across the board. So there you are, there you have it. And I think in the short term, certainly within the, this year, that will be the process that leads to that decision will be decided clearly on in the November election. Beyond that, I think people need to run for office. I think that those who are concerned about health freedoms need to go forward. You know, talent needs to be identified and pushed at a state level because these decisions currently are taken at state level about vaccine mandates, for example. And uh, people who cherish their health freedoms need to be encouraged to run for office. Mm, Thank you for that answer. But Andy, what about people in other countries, people in other places? Yes, it would. we're seeing a global uprising against mandatory vaccination. I've toured and filmed in Europe and Poland and Italy and France, Germany. The, the feeling is very much the same, very, very much the same. And you're seeing this, the influence of the pharmaceutical industry throughout Europe it, doing exactly the same thing, pushing mandatory vaccination and indeed using governments to do it, um, persuading the governments through whatever means they can to uh, to push mandatory vaccination. So. Uh, America is no different in many ways from the rest of the world, but I do believe if we can change things here, it will have a knock-on effect elsewhere. So this is why I see, you know, America as being key to uh, resolving this issue favorably. Mm. So just a couple more questions before we wrap up. When is your movie coming out? The movie is due to air on the 21st of May. Um, I'm hoping that despite uh, everything that's going on and and trying to finish a film remotely, which has never been done before in this way, that we will be able to hit that deadline. Um, We're confident that we will. It's uh, our intention is to launch on a new platform called Sphere, S-P-H-I-R dot I-O. Please make a note of that, S-P-H-I-R dot I-O. It's a new platform. It cannot be censored, it is uh, blockchain encrypted, and it is intended to serve as a platform for this kind of community. It's going to be a hybrid of Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. And I believe that it will be an important part of the future of social media. I think so too. There's been a lot of censorship already on interviews on YouTube and Vimeo. And so we will definitely put a link in the show notes to that platform that you mentioned. Now I want to ask you one final question. If the listener could do one thing, Andy, to to protect or improve their health at this time, what would you recommend that they do? To mothers, and I've said this many times, the most important thing you have is your maternal instinct. We are here on this earth because of maternal instinct, not because of public health or doctors or drugs or vaccines. 
we're here because mothers know their children. They know when they're well, they know when they're ill. They have an instinct that has been cultivated for many, many millions of years. And it has served you well. So please trust your instinct. Trust that little voice inside you because uh, it is a key to the survival of your children and, and yourself. And, and it is an extraordinarily powerful thing. And people have allowed that instinct to be usurped by the man in the white coat, be taken away. I'm the doctor, I know best. No, you don't. No, you absolutely do not. Mothers know their children better than anyone. So I would urge you, uh, particularly mothers, men don't have it in anything like the same way. It's fascinating and I've observed it time and time again. Mm. But I would trust that instinct. Thank you so much for your time, Andy, and for this conversation. We really look forward to connecting with you again. And we look forward to seeing your movie as well. Thank you so much. Our guest today was Dr. Andrew Wakefield. Visit his website, vaxtthemovie.com, and check out other links in the show notes. You can find me at holistichilda.com and on Instagram at holistichilda. And for the show notes for this and every podcast episode, visit our website, westonaprice.org, and go to the podcast page. And here is the letter you've been waiting for from our Spring 2020 Journal. Remember that the journal is free to all members. So if you join our giveaway, for example, you'll get a journal every quarter. Here is this week's letter. Raw milk saved my life. I am very pleased to be able to give my testimony for raw milk. Two years ago, I was diagnosed with diverticulitis. After reading about the options I actually had, which were horrible, tearing out half my intestines, I did all the research I could to find out how to heal my gut. I knew my doctor's advice would end up in endless pill taking, and I didn't want to go that route. Where I live, small dairy farms have sprung up on the outskirts of town. After getting on a waiting list, I finally was called to pick up my fresh raw milk. I had to travel 20 miles to get it, but it was well worth it. In the initial stage of recovery, I drank mostly raw milk and organic beef bone broth, hardly any solids for about six weeks. It was the hardest thing I've ever done. By the two month mark, my intestines relaxed and I was able to take in some pureed foods. I stayed on a strict diet, avoiding my intolerant and allergenic foods for a couple of years, actually, and today I feel great. When I start feeling like my bowels are upset in any way, I know that I'm not drinking enough raw cow's milk. The short and the long of it, raw milk is liquid gold. It healed my guts. It helps me beat the blues in the winter seasonal depression and gives me a glow that causes people to say, you look great. What are you doing? I cannot say enough about the superfood that God has given mankind for nourishment. We do indeed live in a land flowing with milk and honey. Go find it. That is a letter from Teresa in Washington State. Thank you for that, Teresa. And thanks to you for listening. Stay well, my friend, and see you next time. On behalf of the Weston A. Price Foundation, thanks for listening. We have many free resources to support you on your health journey. Visit WestonAPrice.org to find podcasts, articles, videos, and more. You can also find a local chapter near you for help in finding sources of great food. We invite you to support the Foundation's mission of education, research, and activism by becoming a member. Thanks again, and take care. Wise Traditions is a project of the Weston A. Price Foundation for wise traditions in food, farming, and the healing arts. The content on this podcast is provided for informational purposes only and is not intended to substitute for the advice provided by your doctor or other healthcare professional. It is not intended to be, nor does it constitute healthcare or medical advice.